thank you for asking me uh, to talk to you today on CAR T for large B cell lymphoma is what I'll be covering. And uh, primarily, we'll be talking about the third line and second line uh, data, both uh, pivotal data. There is no real world data in second line as yet. Uh, to move my slide. So th these are the currently uh, uh, approved indications, I should say. These are all FDA approved indications and shown on the table is also the EMA and NICE uh, NHS England status of these products. For, so for third line LBCL, uh, there are three products. All are approved by FDA, uh, Yaskata, Kebrea and uh, Brianzi. All are approved by EMA as well. Uh, as you will know, Yaskata and Kebrea are uh, available through, to us through the Cancer Drugs Fund. Escata has actually gone through the final NICE appraisal. We are waiting to hear the outcome uh, of that appraisal. Uh, Brianzi is kind of lagging behind due to mainly due to manufacturing issues. In second line, uh, LBCL, there are two products, uh, Escata and Brianzi, and those are the trials listed there. Uh, both are FDA approved. Uh, we are hoping Escata is imminently going to be EMA approved, and Brianzi is again lagging behind a little bit. Uh, Escata is going to NICE uh, imminently for second line appraisal and we'll again hope to uh, hear the outcome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the third line uh, data to begin, begin with. Uh, we'll look at uh, the pivotal data and a lot of UK data uh, as uh, we have collected over the years. Uh, and then we will move on to look at some of the second line data. So uh, the third line data is really built on the back of what we know are extremely poor outcomes for patients with relapsed or refractory large B-cell lymphoma who received two lines of therapy. So this is scholar one data many of you will be familiar with. This was a large pooled uh, retrospective analysis, spooled data from a couple of clinical trials and from a large uh, you know, uh, uh, database uh, re registries uh, based in the US. So. For the patients who have failed two lines of therapy, essentially, you're looking at a median overall survival of just around six months. And as you can see, uh, the number of patients who survive uh, in, in the long run is, is uh, significantly less than 20%, between 10 to 20% is what it is. And with further therapies, the chances of response are pretty small. The overall chance of responding to further lines of treatment was only around 25% and the chances of achieving a CR with further lines of therapy for these patients was less than 10%. So that is the data that we need to remember when we are looking at uh, what we have achieved with CAR-T therapy. So this is uh, the pivotal uh, ZUMA-1 study based upon which uh, Axicel or Yaskata has been approved and uh, we are using it in this indication. So this is uh, third line uh, patients with large B-cell lymphoma relapsed refractory disease. And as you can see, the overall response rates at an impressive nearly 75% CR set, uh, nearly 54%. And this was a four year follow up presented in ASH a couple of years ago, nearly now. And as you can see, the median overall survival is over two years. And 44% of patients are still alive at four years. There was a five year update presented at ASH last year, and there is very little difference between four and five years. In fact, uh, for patients who not had an event, at 18 to 24 month time point, the uh, risk of further events has been extremely small. So patients who gone 18 months plus from their CAR T therapy seem to be doing extremely well. And these uh, responses seem to be durable, uh, almost uh, suggesting a potential cure, uh, at least for the large B-cell lymphoma patients in this setting. This is data from the Juliet study, which uh, is a TISA cell or Kimbrea. That's the Novartis product. Again, very similar trial to Zuma-1, uh, third line large B-cell lymphoma patients. Response rate slightly lower, around 53% overall response. CRs around 39%. And survival is, again, mirroring the response rates, I would say, in some ways. Again, slightly inferior to what we have seen with Axicel. Important to remember this is not randomized comparison. These are two different trials altogether. Median overall survival just around one year uh, uh, with this product. 
and a three year follow up that we saw in Ash again, a couple of, couple of years ago, nearly that is around 36% uh, overall survival at around three year time point. We've seen some large data sets from US. This is slightly old data now, a couple of years ago now. Uh, this is 275 patients from 17 uh, CAR T centers around the US, basically trying to say that uh, in the real world, in the US, the data, uh, the survival data was essentially mirroring what was published in Zuma 1, uh, even though a majority, a significant number of patients in, in, in this study, I think nearly half of patients would not have met eligibility, uh, the strict eligibility criteria for the Zuma 1 study. So it's reassuring to know that in the real world, we, you know, at least in the US, they were able to replicate the data. And we'll see what happened in the UK now. This is our UK national panel data. Uh, this is data on, for two-year data. This is essentially up, the cutoff was November 2020. Uh, 432 patients uh, who were approved by the panel. So this is all, sorry, submitted to the panel. Uh, 404 approved. So as you can see, you know, almost all patients who go to the panel do get approved. Only, only a minority are not approved. Uh, of these, 375 patients had uh, their uh, T cells collected. Uh, only 300 patients in few. So there is a significant drop off between the number of patients approved, around 400 patients approved and only 300 patients in few. So there's around a 25% drop off. A lot of this drop off is to do with progressive disease and patients deteriorating in the kind of uh, four to six week interval between approval to uh, reaching their CAR T infusion. Uh, 224 patients received axis cells, 76 uh, received tisagen. This is all published data. And this is the toxicity that we have uh, seen in, in the UK. Uh, uh, overall, I would say this is quite reassuring. If you look at CRS, almost everybody who gets axis cell has got CRS. Uh, with T cell around three quarters of patients had CRS. But if you look at grade three or more CRS, that's where patients will end up in ICU. Uh, for inotropic support, for example, that is less than 10%, and it's very comparable for both axis cell and T cell. Again, ICANS, that's always a bit of a scary side effect for patients and for uh, people managing CAR T patients. So, any grade ICANS, uh, overall, uh, about a third of patients have had any grade ICANS, but there is a difference between the two products. Axis cell causes more ICANS than T cell. Uh, close to around half of patients receiving XSL will have some element of ICANS. Uh, the grade 3 ICANS, fortunately, is much less. Only around less than 20% of patients had grade 3 ICANS. And with t it's, it's it's a very tiny fraction who get grade 3 ICANS. The use of tocilizumab, again, is more with uh, axicel than with t cell, reflecting the difference in toxicity. Similarly, the use of steroids is more overall uh, ICU utilization, around 30% of patients have ended up in intensive care unit uh, uh, with, with, with Axicel, only a minority, less than 20% with t cell. Overall, uh, around 25% of patients have gone to ICU, 72% did not, so around 25% went to ICU. And as you see, there is a split. Some patients are going to ICU purely for observation. Our own experience at UHB is almost all patients who went to ICU have been only for observation. Uh, some patients will need anotropes and a minority have need, needed organ support. And if you look at long term uh, cytopenias beyond three months, we are looking at grade three neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. Uh, you are expecting in around 15 to 20 percent of patients may have ongoing cytopenias. And that is the one year non relapse mortality, 7.3% uh, for all patients uh, in, in the UK data. But there is a difference between the two products. Axicel does cause more non relapse mortality than T cell. And that's significantly more than what's, what was shown in the pivotal studies. Uh, there is a contribution being made by COVID to this non relapse mortality. So we need to see how this emerges. And uh, maybe. We are learning a bit more about vaccinations, a bit more about immunoglobulin replacement uh, for these patients. COVID treatments are improving. So that's something that we would like to keep an eye on as we go along. And these are the response rates uh, with uh, <clears throat> third line CAR T therapy uh, in the UK. Uh, I, I think the bottom line, if you just look at the bottom line, the best uh, overall response rates and CR rates uh, with axis cell, 77%, 52%, almost spot on with what has been reported in the pivotal trial. And with, and, 
and with TISA salates running at 57 and 44 percent, again, very similar to uh, what's been reported in the pivotal trial. But there is a difference because in the UK data, we also show three month response and six month response rates. And if you look at three month response rates for Axisal, the three month uh, overall response and CR is 52 and 42 percent. For TISA cell, it's only 37 and 26 percent CR rate. And at six months, again, it's very comparable. It's a small change, really, at the, at the end of six months. And this is some data that uh, we put together to show how uh, the responses evolve over time. This is, you know, you can call it dynamics of response. Uh, the, the, the top right panel is axis cell, the bottom panel is for uh, TISA cell. So as you can see, one month response is actually quite predictive. In, in the UK, we always do a PET scan at one month and a PET scan at three months. Those are the two funded PET scans. If you are in CR at the three month PET scan, then NHS England will not fund any more PET scans. That's the uh, agreement we have with the panel and that's based upon some really good data we have now. Uh, and as you see with axis cell, for example, if you are in a CR at one month, the majority of CRs will be retained. A small number, I would say less than 20% will progress between one and three months, but a majority are retained. But if you are in a PR, 77 patients were in PR at one month, roughly half of them will progress. Uh, some of them will main, continue to maintain a PR. Uh, and uh, so some patients will will convert to CR, a minority convert to CR, around 20% will convert to CR. And again, uh, similar kind of pattern beyond the three to six month time point. But if you're in a CR at six month time point, that bodes really well. Even a PR, even a CR at three month time point bodes very well for long term duration of maintenance of remission. Uh, the T cell data is essentially very similar. I would say there is, I mean, again, PRs. As you can see, 18 patients in PR, roughly half of them will progress between one month and the three month time point. Some of them will continue to maintain a PR and uh, a minority will convert to a CR. So uh, what we have learned is that the one month response assessment is actually fairly predictive. And if you have a stable disease at one month, as you can see, a minority have stable disease, all of them have progressed by the three month time point. So stable disease at one month, we would consider as a failure of treatment. A PR at one month, we would cons we would be quite nervous because it can go either way. We know a little bit more now with, with PRs, the depth of PR is probably important. And we know that all dual five PRs have progressed by three month time point. So if a dual five PR at one month, we would again consider it as a failure of treatment. Duvile 4 PRs are, if you're converting to CR, I, I think that's where you'll see uh, PR to CR conversion is probably more likely to happen in Duvile 4. And this is PFS and OS, and this is infused patient data. Uh, uh, this is across both the products. Uh, so as you will see, median PFS of around uh, three and a half months, 12 month PFS of around just around 40% uh, percent, and 12 month OS just about, about over 50%. So again, this is very comparable to the Zuma 1 data. A majority of patients have received uh, access on this, uh, uh, on this data set. And this is the intention to treat analysis. Uh, if you like, this is all approved patients. So this is all the uh, 400 uh, approved patients on the panel. As you know, around 25% do not proceed to infusion. But this, the solid black line that you see here is the intent to treat patients. So that's the 400 patients. And if you look at intent to treat uh, data, then 12 month OS is around 44% and 24 month OS is around 34%. So that's lagging behind roughly 10 to 15% lower than the infused patient data because of the drop off that we see uh, uh, between approval to infusion. And patients who do not proceed to infusion have a survival curve which is replicating the scholar one data. So this is uh, data we have put together. This is comparing a response of PFS and OS of Axis cell and TISA cell. And as you can see, there is a difference between the two products. Again, this is not, I know, uh, the, 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 this is patient selection to an extent going on between centers and we know uh, i'll show you some data on on axis cell versus tisa cell as we go along but i have to say that this data is replicated across multiple uh, data sets now in in the real world so i think uh, 
there is a difference between the two products in terms of the efficacy that we are seeing. So uh, with Axicel, you're looking at a 12 month uh, PFS of around uh, around 40 percent. With TSA cell, it's running around 27 percent, and OS is around 57 percent and 43 percent. So th th there is there seems to be a real difference between between the efficacy of the two products. But if you do achieve a response so on, on the, the the figure on the left panel is cmr uh, patients achieving a cmr after car t therapy disease so patients who achieve a cmr to axis cell or cmr to tisa cell and that's the best response at any time point uh, their outcomes they, they, their pfs seems to be excellent so cmr seem to be really durable uh, as long as you achieve one as we have seen, the chance of achieving a CMR with TSA cell is significantly less than with axis cell. But if you do achieve CMR, they are durable. Uh, PRs, if, if your best response is only going to be a PR, then that's that's not going to be durable. And on the right panel is the figure which is essentially, it's a landmark time point. If you are in a CR at six months, and then the PFS are extremely durable. So that seems to be a very good time point. But even at, at three months, they, they, they will be very durable. Only a minority of patients will progress between the three to six month time point uh, if they are in a CR at three months. We've done some subgroup analysis, uh, looking at uh, some of the risk factors. Th these have been shown in other data sets as well, other real world data sets. And if you look at uh, the number of external sites, for example, patients who had three uh, or more external sites, uh, you can see PFS and OS on the left, left panels. Uh, clearly, more external sites, your uh, PFS and OS drop off. Similarly, LDH has a well established uh, uh, risk factor. This is LDH at the time of conditioning for the CAR T we are talking of. And if you have elevated LDH or LDH more than two times the upper limit of normal, uh, there seem to be an incremental uh, effect of that uh, in terms of losing your PFS and OS. Uh, ECO performance status, as uh, uh, some of you will know, we are allowed to infuse patients uh, of ECOG 0, 1 or even 2. At the time of conditioning and infusion, a patient can have a performance status of 2, though they need to have a performance status of 0 and 1 at the time of approval. Uh, but again, as you can see, the performance status at the time of CAR-T conditioning does make a difference. If you have a ECOG status of 0, you have the best outcomes. And if you have performance status of 1 or 2, then the outcomes do drop off. We were not able to do T uh, total metabolic tumor volume analysis on our data set yet, but it is again a well uh, reported risk factor. This is a US data set a couple of years old now, uh, and they have used a median uh, cutoff uh, patients with high uh, MTV as in greater than median and patients with low MTV as in uh, uh, less than median. And as you will see, there is a significant effect of uh, the metabolic tumor volume. This is preconditioning uh, going into into CAR T. If you have, if you come with a lot of disease into CAR T, then your PFS and OS is going to be inferior. And this has been replicated in other data sets. We've certainly seen with the French real world data set. So moving on, we'll look at uh, some of the other aspects that we tried to look at in our data set. So this is looking at patients level of fitness coming into CAR-T. Does your fitness matter? And we have tried to assess fitness based upon uh, so-called transplant fit versus transplant not fit. To an extent, this is arbitrary. This is depending upon the CAR-T clinician or the CAR-T center deciding whether a patient is transplant fit or not fit. Uh, and a lot of this is driven by age uh, in the sense patients over the age of 70 generally considered not to be transplant fit. Some of it is driven by organ function as in renal function or uh, echocardiogram because we do accept slightly lower uh, organ cutoffs for uh, CAR-T than we would accept for a high dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, so with those caveats, anyway, there were 404 uh, patients uh, of which approved patients we are talking of by the panel. 323 were considered transplant fit by the CAR-T center. 80 when were considered non, not to be transplant fit. As you can see in the transplant fit, there is a 24% drop off between approval to infusion. But in the non-transplant fit, there is even a bigger drop off. Uh, more than a third of patients have not proceeded to infusion, primarily because 
they, 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 they decline in their performance status, largely to do with progressive disease. Uh, but if you do reach the infusion, uh, and if you get your CAR-T therapy, then the outcomes are essentially identical. That is the PFS curve, but for both transplant fit and not fit, uh, it's identical. Uh, the lines overlap completely. And this is some data that's been put together uh, anal analyzing by age. Uh, as I said, even the previous slide, age does have a significant influence on deciding on transplant fitness, but this is proper age-based analysis of, of the data set now. Uh, using age cutoffs of less than 70, 70 to 74, and 75 and above, which are, I guess, quite old in terms of CAR-T therapy, uh, at least. Uh, so again, that's the split, uh, 328 patients uh, under 70, 62 uh, in that age group, only a very small number of patients over the age of 75. But as you can see, there's a significant difference in terms of drop-off between approval to infusion, 23% in less than 70, a third of patients, uh, 70 to 74, and half of patients uh, over the age of 75 never proceeded to infusion despite having been approved by the panel. And this is choice of CAR-T product. This is what I was referring to in the earlier slide. So in terms of choice of CAR-T product, there clearly is a difference. Uh, patients under the age of 70, if you look at more than 75% are receiving Axicel. Uh, whereas if you come to patients in their 70s, it's almost half and half between Axicel and TSA cell. And patients over 75, it's reverse now, about nearly uh, three quarters are receiving TSA cell. So clearly this is driven by clinician choice and we have seen the toxicity data t cell certainly is less toxic especially the icans the grade 3 icans which is which is i guess the, the worrying uh, side effect and th that is driving uh, the choice of the product here and this is response to car t therapy according to age of the patients again if you forget uh, all the details and if you just concentrate on the best response so these are patients who have received the infusion uh, that's important to remember and if you look at the overall response rates and the CR rates they are pretty good so if you reach the infusion then you seem to be doing well and this is PFS and OS again uh, shown by age PFS curves almost overlap uh, for, the, for these patients age group so age doesn't seem to have any influence anymore once they receive the CAR-T infusion, the OS curves are slightly separated, but overall there is no statistically significant difference be between these OS curves. So some of these patient numbers are small. So again, reiterating the message that if you do re receive the infusion, then age per se does not seem to have a significant bearing. Uh, there is some effect on non-relapse mortality. We have seen you know, uh, the uh, under the age of 70, non-relapse mortality running around 6.8 percent but for patients over the age of 70 it's running at around 12.2 percent uh, a lot of it is driven by infections covid is has had a important uh, bearing on on non-relapse mortality in the last uh, couple of years uh, this is some extended data set as uh, we call it. It's extended only because the original data set was cut off was November 2020 and this data set has gone until December 2021 uh, and just looking at patients over the age of 75. So there are a bit more uh, patients in this now, 38 patients in that age group, only 24 proceeded to infusion. So again, there is nearly between 35-40% drop off uh, uh, in this as you can see, there is a bit of a signal of uh, ICANs, especially grade three ICANs, 8.3%, uh, given that a majority of these patients are receiving TSA cell is probably maybe suggesting there's a little bit more ICANs than we would expect. And that may be a age-driven phenomenon. We also looked at uh, bridging, uh, and so bridging is what we give to patients bit from between after collecting the T cells uh, whilst waiting for the CAR T manufacture to happen. So, uh, of the 400 patients approved uh, and 375 patients who had T cells collected, as you will see, a majority of them have received bridging. Only around 50 have not received bridging. So, you can say more than 80 85 percent of patients do receive bridging. More than half of patients have received chemotherapy-based bridging. Uh, radiotherapy is 
it's given 60 or so patients receiving radiotherapy and combined modalities patients receiving uh, a combination of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, steroids. Those are the responses to bridging uh, that, that we have seen. So if you look at radiotherapy bridging here, uh, the CR or PR rate, nearly two thirds of patients achieve a CR or PR. But if you look at chemotherapy bridging, which a majority of patients receive, less than a third achieve a response. And if you look at CR rate, that's even that's even less than 10%. So bridging is a problem in the sense a majority of patients will not respond to bridging. I guess that's why we are trying to deliver CAR-T because they have failed chemotherapy. They have failed two pretty good lines of chemotherapy. So maybe it is you know, it is entirely in keeping with what we should expect with, with bridging therapy. So polar BR or, or RBP uh, is a very popular bridging strategy in the UK. Uh, if you look at uh, the polar BR uh, response rates, just around 40% overall response rates, CR rates are less than 15%. So whilst polar BR may have made some difference, I guess it is better than high dose chemotherapy regimens or low dose chemotherapy regimens. But still, there is a long way for us to go to improve the bridging strategies. And based upon all the data we have seen before, your LDH, your metabolic tumor volume, you know, your external sites, your performance status even is, is driven by the amount of disease or the speed with disease is progressing. So if you have better bridging strategies and you can get disease under control, maybe we'll get more patients to infusion and maybe improve the post-infusion outcomes as well. So bridging does remain a significant uh, area of unmet need. And this is looking at uh, PFS and OS after CAR T therapy based upon whether patients respond to bridging or not. So uh, if you look at the, 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 uh, the top panels is looking at patients who respond or not respond. So that's PFS based upon whether patients have had a response. If a patient has had a CR or PR, their PFS is better than if patients have a stable disease or progressive disease. And the same applies to their overall survival. Now, this is looking at uh, the, the depth of response. So this is trying to differentiate response into CR versus PR. So CR and PR both seem to be doing fairly well as far as uh, PFS is concerned and OS also I, I would say is, is not really that different. So some element of response to bridging uh, seems to be important compared to having stable disease or progressive disease. Progressive disease after bridging is, is not a good sign. And we've also looked at uh, whether the CAR-T product has an effect uh, itself. So this is looking at PFS. Uh, according to response to bridging, uh, this is comparing axicel and tisocel. So this is left left panel is axicel, and as you can see, patients uh, th there is a difference between responders and not responders, but uh, nowhere near as pronounced as, as it is for tisocel. So if you are receiving tisocel, I guess or probably it's uh, it goes without saying that you should have some response to uh, your bridging strategy. Otherwise, this is all doomed to fail. With that, I'll move on to uh, a few slides on second line uh, CAR-T therapy uh, for large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, this is again driven by data that we have seen previously. I'm just showing data from Orchard study. Orchard was a study which compared uh, DHAP uh, with rituximab versus ofatumumab in transplant eligible relapsed refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. It was delivered as second line therapy. And this is what uh, we found. So this is PFS, uh, compared, looking at PFS of patients who relapsed more than 12 months from first line therapy. And this is PFS for patients who relapsed within 12 months of first line therapy or were primary refractory to first line therapy. So there is a big difference. We know if, if you relapse early within 12 months of your first line therapy, then your PFS and that's OS. Uh, is is quite dismal. Uh, PFS of less than 20% and OFS, OS is only around 35%. So that's where uh, CAR-T uh, trials have been done in second line to try and improve upon these outcomes. So the stand, uh, the uh, so Zuma 7 is, is a phase three randomized study. It's, it's, it's the first of uh, the three studies that were done in second line setting. Uh, patients essentially were, uh, as I showed on the last slide. So these are patients with large B-cell lymphoma who are either primary refractory or have relapsed within 12 months of their first line therapy. And shown here is the uh, study design. Patients were randomized one is to one against axicel 
or standard of care, which was two to three lines of platinum containing therapy followed by autologous stem cell transplant for patients who had a response chemosensitive uh, disease. So uh, primary endpoint was EFS. Uh, shown here are response rates uh, for the two arms, 180 patients in the excess alarm and uh, 179 in the standard of care arm. Uh, overall response rates in excess of 80%, CR rates of 65% and compared to only around 50% overall response rates and very uh, CR rates in only about a third of patients. So th this is very comparable to what was uh, reported in object study previously. Uh, so significant improvement in ORR and CR rates with uh, CAR-T therapy compared to standard of care chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant. And th those are the survival curves. So the top panel is uh, EFS, which was the primary endpoint. And it, as you can see, median EFS 8.3 months versus two months and a two-year EFS of just over 40% compared to only around 16% for uh, chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant. And you, here you will see the overall survival curves. Uh, the, the, this has not yet reached stati statistical significance, even though the p-value is running at 0 0.01. There is a trend to separation of the overall survival. But you must remember that the red line, which is the standard of care overall survival, is far superior to what was seen previously, for example, the slides that I showed you with Orchard and we believe that's primarily being held up by a lot of patients switching to CAR-T therapy in third line. 56% of patients in the standard of care arm in this trial received CAR-T therapy in third line and that possibly is affecting the overall survival uh, curve here. Uh, this is the TRANSFORM study with uh, lisocaptagen maralus cell or Brianzis. Uh, this is the BMS cell gene study. Again, very similar design to uh, the ZUMA7 study with some minor differences between the two studies. But if you look at the results, they are almost identical. You know, the CR rates of 66% with LISO cell uh, compared to 39% with standard of care chemotherapy, overall response rates of 86% and around 50% with chemotherapy. Again, that's the EFS, which was the primary endpoint, a clear difference between uh, CAR-T therapy versus standard of care chemotherapy. And the overall survival curves here are again beginning to separate out, showing a advantage for, for LISA cell. So this is some subgroup analysis uh, from the ZUMA7 study, uh, and it just shows that again, a, you know, all subgroups that were looked at have benefited from CAR-T therapy compared to receiving standard of care chemotherapy. Interest of interest, I guess, is IPI of interest is uh, double hit lymphoma, double express R lymphoma. They've all, they've all responded. CAR-T seems to be fairly agnostic of these biological uh, markers. And this is some further data looking at uh, uh, the, the tumor bulk, if you like. So uh, this is looking at the sum of perpendicular diameter. So that was used as a marker of uh, the tumor burden for this analysis. So whether patients had high SPD or low SPD as defined by more than median or less than median, uh, there didn't seem to be much difference for axis cell, but clearly there was some difference for standard of care chemotherapy. Similarly, LDH in this study, the ZUMA7 study did not seem to make a difference for CAR-T therapy, but there was a difference for standard of care chemotherapy. And this is looking at GCB versus non-GCB axis cell. Uh, there was no difference, but standard of care non-GCB seems to have done uh, worse than, than uh, the GCB patient. So essentially trying to say that axis cell is probably able to overcome some of the poor prognostic markers that your standard of care chemotherapy may not be able to do. This is a bit of further subset analysis done. I think of, of interest to me at least here is the CD19 status of the tumor and CD19 status did seem to have some bearing in the sense if you have a high H score, that's a histology score on your IHC staining, that seems to be doing better compared to patients who were CD19 negative, uh, that is cutting across uh, it's a bit difficult to know because this will boil down to small numbers, but there seems to be some impact of the of the CD19 status of the tumor uh, in terms of their EFS. This is looking at uh, the CAR T expansion itself, uh, uh, looking at the peak CAR T levels. Responders had higher peak CAR T levels, the median being 28.94 CAR T cells per microliter. 
compared to non-responders. Similarly, they had a uh, higher area under curve compared to non-responders. And again, this is looking at uh, the, the effect of, 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 of CAR-T on in patients with uh, tumor burden. This is again the sum of the perpendicular diameters. So with, with standard of care, as the tumor diameter uh, went up, the response rates have, the CR rates have come down, whereas with Axicel, the impact seems to be minimal. This is looking at the T-cell uh, uh, phenotype in, in the CAR-T products. So CAR-T products which are enriched for naive CCR7 expressing and CD45 RA T-cells uh, in the products seem to have done extremely well. So uh, these are curves for patients with who had a higher than median number of uh, these naive T-cells in their product. This is a curve for patients with lower than median number of uh, uh, naive T cells in the product compared with with the standard of care uh, e EFS, and also looking at uh, the exhaustion phenotype. Uh, so this is looking at uh, again within the axicel patients who have so-called exhaust exhausted T cell phenotype with CD27 loss, CD28 loss, expression PD1 and TIM3, and CD8 uh, compared to patients who have a naive and non-exhausted phenotype who are who seem to have better outcomes. So the T-cell phenotype seems to be important uh, in, in determining the uh, durability of the response. So th that's my last slide. Uh, uh, just to summarize that uh, CAR-T therapy clearly has made a important uh, positive impact on outcomes, both in second line and third line for large B-cell lymphoma patients. Uh, but there clearly is a significant unmet need here uh, bridging strategies, I, I mentioned before, a considerable number of patients drop off between approval and infusion. And if we have better bridging strategies, uh, maybe we can bring more patients into CRPR. Maybe they will have low tumor volume going into CAR-T, uh, maybe a normal LDH, and their outcomes are likely to be better based upon the data we have at the moment. Similarly, improving the fitness of the T cells uh, uh, may be relevant, but how do we do that? Maybe getting CAR-T earlier lines of therapy. You know, you have had less t chemotherapy exposure, maybe different CAR-T manufacturing techniques. So these are all being explored. Uh, and can we do anything about manipulating the CAR-T itself after after we treat a patient with CAR-T therapy? Do we do it for everybody? Do we, do we only do it for patients with a suboptimal response that maybe at one month time point? Uh, so checkpoint inhibitors have been tried. The data is not really particularly uh, exciting, I have to say. I think that is probably a story that's gone now. Bispecific antibodies generating a lot of interest, but not much data. And redirecting CAR, that's another strategy of interest. Uh, we are in the process of setting up a trial with this ALITA001 protein. Hopefully that will uh, be up and running sometime next year. So this is a car T engager protein, which is, which is aimed at Re, re, uh, you know, reactivating the car, if you like, by providing a new target for the car. And the plan is to give patients this infusion at one month post CAR-T therapy. So with that, I will finish and I'll be happy to take any questions. I'm sorry for running over. <laughs>